Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Cox. I'm a member of the Net Capital team. Let's allow one minute for everybody to settle in. Thanks. All righty, let's go ahead and start diving in. Uh, welcome again. I'm excited to be here with three team members here, three different companies, each of them actively raising capital on the Net Capital platform. We're joined by Yayan, KMX Technologies, as well as Proctor360. Um, as always, as I mentioned, these companies are actively raising capital on the Net Capital platform. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and add the links to each of those into the chat feature here in Zoom. There's all three of them there. Um, I, a couple of quick housekeeping items. I know that I just used the chat feature. I'm asking you to please use the Q&A feature. That makes it a lot easier for me to track all the questions as they come in. And we do want to get to as many of them as possible. Please do engage with the Q&A. We want to keep this interactive, uh, but the chat feature makes it a lot harder to track, uh, to track questions. Feel free to use the chat to say hello. Hello there. Um, for the people engaging with chat, that's great. But if you do have a question for any of the panelists, please do use the Q&A feature built into Zoom. Um, again, as I mentioned, three companies will present. We'll all lot about uh, five to 10 minutes for presentation and allow some time for questions as well. So please do ask those questions. But in the interest of time, why don't we go ahead and dive in here with Pierre Rogers, with Yayan. Come on in, Pierre. Tell us a little bit about what you're building. Thank you so much for having me. The law of unintended consequences. How did a single law create two of the largest crime syndicates in the United States? My name is Pierre Rogers. I'm the founder of Yayin.com. And the law of unintended consequences is prohibition in this case. So in 1920, we had prohibition and it lasted about 12, 12 and a half years, uh, which means we as the United States stopped selling alcohol, wine, beer, spirits completely. And that actually gave way to two crime syndicates. One, Al Capone, of course, right? The, the mafia that ran uh, booze and gambling and all of the other things sprouted out because of those restrictions. Well, one of the other crime syndicates that popped out of that was actually what we call the three tier system. This is actually how all beer, wine and spirits are distributed in the United States. And basically what that means is that in 1933, the federal government said, okay, United States, you guys can sell booze, wine, et cetera, again. And we gave it to states rights, which means each state had the ability to transact and commerce uh, alcohol in the way they felt fit. What that really means is you had 50 different states with 50 different sets of laws, permits, regulatory environment, etc. It is a massive and heavy burden. So if you are a winemaker and you would like to sell across the United States, the regulatory burden is massive. Not only do you have to have all the regulatory and compliance in place before you sell into that state, but you need to pay all the permits before getting your first customer. One way we can test this theory if it's true is have you ever noticed when you go to a restaurant and you happen to look at the wine list? And I don't just mean the super fancy restaurants. Frankly, I just mean any restaurant that might have a page or two for a wine list. You ever noticed how you don't recognize most of the names that are on that list? Or how if you do buy that bottle of wine that's on the list, you never find it at the Whole Foods or the Trader Joe's or the local liquor store? You ever wonder why? Well, it's because, believe it or not, two, just two privately placed companies control about 78% of all beer, wine, and spirits distribution in the United States. So said differently, just two people 
at two different companies control most, the vast majority of all of wine distribution in the US. That's absolutely crazy. Yayan seeks to positively disrupt that by using a B2C marketplace platform that we built on the ground up on a Ruby on Rails platform. We built all the compliance and regulatory burden into that platform, which allows for tens of thousands of vineyards in the United States to upload their wine digitally, their inventory, and sell throughout the United States. More importantly, it allows for consumers, people like you and I, to be able to find any wine that we are looking for. And more specifically, there are three main benefits from the consumer standpoint in using Yayan. Number one is inventory. Whether it's the largest mega vineyard that is out there or the tiniest mom and pop boutique vineyard that only make a few cases a year, both of them are equally well represented on Yayan and you will be able to find it. So superior selection. Right now we have over 12,000 different bottles of wine on the site, making us the second largest wine store in the United States. By the end of the year, we'll have about 25,000 wines, easily making us the largest digital wine store in the world. So number one is selection. Two is price. When you're buying it directly from the, the winemaker, you're cutting out that middleman. You're cutting out this three-tier system. The reason why they exist is because of that prohibition era. I jokingly call them the second crime syndicate because what they have done is they are the ones who own all the licenses and permits and retail distribution. So think of them as the blockbuster, right? So they own this massive retail distribution network to push out that content. And then little old Netflix comes by and says, hey, there's a new way. Lower prices, better inventory, better way to manage that business. That in this case, is Yayin. So we offer superior inventory, far, far better from a pricing perspective. And then lastly, is actually, we are far more environmentally efficient. So when you think about when you order a bottle of wine, when you order it directly from the vineyard through the Yayin platform, ultimately what you're doing is that wine is going from where it's produced directly to where it is consumed. No stops along the way. If you're buying it through more traditional retail channels, it's going through a much longer and more burdensome distribution, and thus the carbon footprint per bottle is far, far greater. Uh, we're happy to be on uh, Net Capital and doing our raise. We're doing a small raise on Net Capital this time around. I think we're doing about 300,000. We had a very successful raise on Net, Net Capital about a year ago. And we have grown tremendously uh, since then. One last thing to highlight is just our team. Uh, most of the people on our team have at least one exit under their belt. Our CTO, Robert Bousquet, uh, has many more than that. Uh, Appfolio, uh, Lookout.com, and many others uh, he was early employees at. We've got a tremendously powerful board, and all of that team working together has really made uh, this growth possible. So thank you to Net Capital, uh, and I appreciate the time, Eric. Thank you so much, Pierre. Um, and for those who aren't as familiar with fine wine, you have this Clooney-esque glow about you, so I know you're a wine connoisseur, <laughs> but could you tell us, you know, do you help a uh, random Joe Schmo find, uh, find a, a wine that they might enjoy? Yes, th thank you. Um, so one of the biggest problems that wine consumers have uh, this is whether you're super advanced or you're brand new to wine drinking is which wine do I like? What, what, which one do I pick? You're like, great, Pierre, you got 12,000 wines. I don't know any of them. Which one? Do, what do I do now? Right. And so we actually have two different avenues to help you, the consumer, find that perfect bottle of wine for you. So one of them is to actually chat with a live sommelier. So if you go to Yayin.com right now, we have a chat service very similar to many websites. Big difference with us is those are real sommeliers, right? We have to remember that during COVID, during the pandemic, sommeliers were unemployed, right? For arguably the longest period of time because those restaurants where they tend to work at were the ones that were affected the most. We were actually able to hire nearly 20 sommeliers over the past 18 months. These are level two and above. They are there to help you.
full stop. So they, we use a gig economy style uh, model here. Um, they are not incentivized to sell you one thing over another. They are quite literally there for you to chat with to find that perfect bottle of wine. Because we know that even if you're standing in the line at Whole Foods trying to figure out what you're making for dinner and, you, and they give you a recommendation and you buy it off the shelf at Whole Foods, we know that if we provide you with value and we're a trusted resource, those consumers will come back. And the data shows that. Uh, second is for people who maybe don't wanna have that chat, right? They want something a little bit more efficient, little, little cleaner. We actually use some software that's powered by a company called Tastry that will, using artificial intelligence and machine learning, will actually guide you to your perfect bottle of wine. And real quick to dig into this, what makes us different is that each bottle of wine is actually sent to our laboratory in San Luis Obispo, California. It is tested for various chemical compounds that represent flavor. We then, using some data scientists from Cal Poly, ask you, the wine drinker, a series of non-wine related questions. To be clear, you don't have to know anything about wine. So questions such as, uh, do you like the smell of fresh cut grass? Because remember, olfactory sense is 70% of taste. Uh, do you like the taste of black coffee, et cetera? In the background, our AI is taking and adjusting your answers to what is available out there. And we give you what we call our Y score. This is a percent match to the wines that we know that you're going to enjoy. What that means is the likelihood of you as a customer buying a bad bottle of wine or a bottle of wine you don't like has been reduced to near zero. Either way, the outcome is the same. Our goal is to find you, the customer, that perfect bottle of wine. Thanks for that, Pierre. And I do remember uh, the way that you qualify a, a, a successful match uh, is different than other websites as well, if I remember correctly. Can we, can we dig into that matching success as well for a little bit? Yes, absolutely. So some other companies have tried to use some sort of taste profile to help from a marketing perspective, add some value to the underlying customer. And um, what we do here is very, very different because AI is price agnostic, flavor agnostic, et cetera. And we're using real objective um, objectified, excuse me, results, not subjective. So that is very different. Number one. Number two, when we give you a recommendation, our goal isn't actually to find the best bottle of wine in the whole wide world for you. Our goal is actually to make sure you don't choose a bad bottle of wine. Actually, we focus on removing the chance that you waste your hard earned money, right? If we start with what we call the risk or the beta, um, then we know that you're going to have a better experience and that users will come back over and over. Now, the output of this is our efficacy rate. How right are we? Because ultimately people go, yeah, Pierre, that sounds great, but like, does this thing actually work, right? Our efficacy rate is 92% of the time, customers will buy that bottle again. This is really important. Not that they liked the bottle of wine, but that they liked it so much, they're going to come back and buy it again. That is an incredibly high number. And the way that we do that is by removing wines that you're not going to enjoy, that aren't going to suit your palate. No, I, I always thought that was a really interesting distinction from you and other players in the space was that repurchase rate as the measure of success. I think that's really interesting. For these last couple of minutes, I know you come from venture. Uh, some of your team members have come from venture finance. I know Yayan has raised venture capital. Can you talk a little bit about your other advisors and investors and supporters? You definitely have quite a bit of industry experience from the advisory team and the investor team. Yes, thank you very much. So we have a deep bench, if you will, from an experience perspective. So very quickly, you guys can go to yayan.com, uh, see it there. Obviously, our NetCap page, um, our team is there as well. So a couple of people to highlight, John Cooper, uh, former 
founder of a company called Ebu, exited to Canopy for about $450 million. Great operator, uh, now GP at Evolution Ventures. He made a large investment into us and now sits on our board. Just killer from an operations standpoint, just tremendously valuable there. Uh, Pam Hamlin. So Pam is just a huge heavy hitter, right? So she is former president of Arnold, uh, Arnold being one of the largest marketing companies in the world. I believe they are the largest in the United States. Uh, so she was the North American president. Uh, she is tremendously valuable when it comes to branding, marketing, storytelling, right? Really speaking to our audience. Um, we then have Todd Nestor. So Todd is a former treasury at PepsiCo, uh, went on to become the architect behind the Grey Goose and Bacardi acquisition, uh, which you have to remember uh, was the largest at the time uh, prior to George Clooney selling a little tequila. Actually, that one uh, was the largest uh, prior to that. Uh, and then next you have uh, a couple other big hitters. So you've got Chris Ludicrous Bridges um, from Fast and the Furious fame. I, I kind of joke and say, yes, that ludicrous. Uh, Chris, for people who don't know, outside of his uh, entertainment career, um, has been a serial entrepreneur, um, clothing line, alcohol brand. He owned a uh, cognac brand. Uh, he also owns a chain of restaurants called Chicken and Beer, right? So he adds an element of A, access to other celebrities from an influence perspective. He adds to us being hip and fresh, right? Really sort of pushing um, our social narratives as well. Um, and he is just a, a tremendous resource. Uh, next, you've got Rob Weiss. Um, remember that wine, before I talk about Rob real quick, a lot of wine is about story. Right. We, we buy wines because of the, the way it makes us feel, what it tells about other people, uh, what we want it, other people to think about us. So Rob Weiss, uh, also on our board, Rob was the writer for Entourage, went on to become writer director for uh, Ballers on HBO, worked with Dwayne The Rock Johnson, uh, et cetera. But when you want to talk about a storyteller right the ability to drive a narrative and a story rob is just absolutely tremendous for us so those are just a few of the people that we have on the team um and then most of us are by way of venture uh so both my cfo myself and four out of the six board members all come directly from vc land and so it's an interesting question is well why are we on net capital right why are we on net capital if we all come from vc land um because frankly we get more value out of a crowd round than we do at a VC round. And I'll quantify it really simply for you guys. Um, for a investor that comes across on net capital and makes a, an investment into us, yes, we get the investment dollars, that's great. But you know what we else we get? We get a spokesperson, we get a marketer, we get a, someone who wants us to be successful times hundreds. Right. Our last raise, we had 14, 1500 investors on net capital. That means I got 1500 people who really want us to be successful, who come and buy from our platform, who tell their mom and dad, right, who tell their friends and coworkers. That is really valuable relative to getting just one check from one entity, right? Which is why we opened up a smaller round out of this larger round that we're doing here on net capital, because the value of, the, of your community is just awesome for us. Well, I, I, obviously, I drank the Kool Aid. I believe in the vision as well. So I love, I love hearing that that positive feedback. Um, we're about to wrap up here uh, with with Yayan. Before we do, a question from the audience: uh, Will this be available in Canada? Also, good question. Yes. So, in short, yes, it will be. Currently, we're bringing in wines from an import perspective from all over the world yes canada makes wine if people aren't aware of that uh and so we're actually going to be bringing in canadian wines into the united states soon the platform will then be turned around and be opened up in canada obviously a different set of regulatory burdens so we've got to have our attorneys sort of attack that um because really at the end of the day our platform is just that it is a platform like an airbnb or a tinder or uber um but attacking a specific vertical and the value is the legal if you will the compliance and regulatory burden that we've unlocked using the software yeah no it's really interesting pierre thank you so much for that and sharing the good news about yayan as I mentioned, they're actively raising capital for the second time on Net Capital. I'm adding a link to that into the chat one more time. Feel free to go over there and check it out um, and share that generally uh, with anybody that you think might be interested in learning more and potentially investing. Thank you so much, Pierre. Always a pleasure, brother. Um, Hi, Jack. 
Next up, we have KMX Technologies. Zachary, why don't you come on in and tell us a little bit about what you're doing with KMX, and I'm adding a link to that directly into the chat right now as well. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, Eric. Pierre, that was great. Really cool stuff. I, uh, I, I would like to try this out myself here. Um, great. Love that. Uh, Eric, should I, I have some slides here. Um, I, yeah. I, so what would you? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you should have access to share your screen now. Perfect, great. All right, well, thanks a lot. Um, I'm CEO of KMX Technologies. Uh, KMX is a, it's a pretty extraordinary um, story here that we're, can you see that? We can. Great, cool. All right, thanks a lot. So KMX is a really powerful cross-cutting technology that separates minerals, particles from pure water. Now, this is a really extraordinary cross-cutting technology that has a lot of different end, end market applications. We've chosen three, and we think these three represent some of the biggest environmental challenges and opportunities today. Water, treating water to an extraordinarily high um, uh, level where, where, it's, where it's a z zero liquid discharge capable. Um, lithium, enhancing lithium production that comes out of brines from, uh, from, from, from below ground, uh, geothermal sources or above ground as well um, in, in, in lakes found in South America and elsewhere, and then critical minerals. Uh, critical minerals are things like rare earth elements that are extremely important for electric vehicles, uh, communications, the defense industry, all of these things are found in very low concentrations. Uh, um, uh, they're, 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 they're poised to, to experience huge demand growth over the coming decades. And they're, they're obviously in uh, all over the news right now and, and in demand now, but uh, we think they're only gonna become more and more important. Um, the technology is able to do a lot of different things, but we can't do everything. But these are some of the markets that we've chosen. Now, water and lithium right now, are the team's core focuses. Uh, what we do in the water market, as I, as I, as I said, we, we, we treat water to a very high uh, specification. So if you think about reverse osmosis, you're treating about 90% of, of the water through seawater desalination, let's just say. And the other 10% comes back, is, is, it's all concentrated. And at that point, it's called reverse osmosis reject. And it's a very briny, uh, saturated uh, salt or whatever else you might be concentrating up. And we treat that. So we treat what really reverse osmosis can't treat, or we work with them as a complementary technology. The market for that is, is growing significantly as states, governments, uh, industry looks to really knock out that last mile of uh, treatment, which is also very complex. And often this is what gets discharged into river, rivers, oceans, bodies of water um, on the ground. And as states get more and more aggressive about that, as corporations want to clean up their, um, um, uh, their environmental footprint, we have a huge opportunity to help both of those out. We're working on some really exciting projects right now, uh, maybe hope to talk about later, um, which, which would be obviously transformational for the company if we were to. Um, um, uh, move forward with some of these. One of them, for example, um, or, or a few of them, is um, uh, inland, inland desalination, pulling up brackish groundwater from um, um, for a municipality, reverse osmosis treating that, and then us treating the reverse osmosis reject instead of it going via pipeline to, to the ocean and obviously messing up the shoreline ecology. Huge opportunity there for us. Now, obviously, um, the growth that we're recognizing or looking at in the water treatment market is exciting, but not, but nowhere near uh, what we're looking at for our next um, uh, core market, which is actually our, 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 our top market from a commercial perspective, which is the lithium market. Lithium is poised to experience significant uh, upside demand in the coming years here, obviously powered by the, the electric vehicle build out or at the early innings of a multi-decade upcycle. 
uh, in our opinion, as a team here. Uh, some of the estimates that you see conservatively place lithium, lithium demand at about 800% or so over the next couple of decades, 600% of this decade. I've seen you know, uh, estimates that, that are so aggressive, we wouldn't even you know, want to include them, but, but they actually, um, uh, they're, you know, they're coming from leading experts that are looking at this space um, um, with a pretty clear eyes. So what we do in the lithium market is it mirrors what we do in the water treatment market a little bit. And I'll touch on that in a, in a minute when we get to um, uh, some case studies or when we talk about our, our uh, I'll, I'll break that down a little bit. The rare earth element market is something that's um, very important from a national security standpoint, from a geopolitical standpoint, from a supply chain standpoint. However, it's less of a focus for us right now, even though it's an extraordinarily exciting market, only because the tailwinds that we're experiencing right now from the lithium market and the large market opportunity that we're looking at for some of these water treatment opportunities. However, we're excited to go after uh, the rare earth element market and the critical minerals. And you can see some of these figures here. Uh, there's 920 pounds of rare earths in every F-35 uh, fighter jet, over 90% of EVs, there's rare earth elements. And obviously a lot of the rare earth elements are coming from abroad. Um, so there's a huge opportunity to develop our own domestic um, uh, supply here, which of course is a is current focus for the, 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 the administration. But once again, less of a current uh, uh, focus for us today. So let me just talk about KMX and you know, what we do. Um, this is kind of a snapshot of, of, of what it is that we do. Um, in the middle there, that's a mobile treatment unit. This is a small scale treatment unit. In many ways, it's a demo, it's a demo treatment unit where we can pull it up uh, at, in, at a complex industrial uh, site um, for any kind of end user in a municipality and show the e efficacy of our process here. And this, this uh, trailer, this technology has undergone uh, a number of successful demos for some of the largest um, uh, corporations in the world, actually. So it's, 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 it's pretty exciting. Um, the picture on the right there of the, um, uh, that's, that's actually a, the previous generation technology um, treatment unit, which is great in its own right, but we've, we're, we're now working on building out the next generation unit. Uh, both these are in New Mexico currently the mobile unit and the, the Gen 2 unit. And the team is pretty hard at work right now on uh, building out a scaled up version of the, uh, the next generation one. The lab scale unit, this technology is called membrane distillation. And we'll, I'll, I'll touch on that in the coming up um, technology slide. We believe, or our scientists believe, um, that this is the most advanced membrane dis distillation laboratory in the world. It's really exciting stuff. Um, we, 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 we just opened this lab in Toronto. It's led by one of our lead scientists, Dr. Matt Narrell. Um, and, you know, we're really right now, uh, there's the control room in the back there. Um, you know, we're looking to add on this and, and enhance it more and continue to progress, uh, with the next generation of technology here and really lead the market in this space. So these are, these are some of the uh, the, 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 and, then, and then, of course, uh, our, our expanding IP portfolio. So this is really our, in addition to our people, which is our core asset, our asset base right here. Uh, the technology. So what we do is different than, let's just say, reverse osmosis. And, and, and one of the core differentiators is that we use a hydrophobic membrane where water cannot pass through. And reverse osmosis uses a, um, a hydrophilic membrane where they encourage water to, to push through and then it captures particles. And by passing through the, the, uh, the membranes over and over, uh, the water is treated. In many ways, we're the opposite of this. Water flows through bundles of uh, what looks like straws of hydrophobic membranes and vapor um, is created by a vacuum pulling on it from the outside. 
and water changes from its natural state to a vapor state, moves to the other side of the membrane. And whatever it is we're trying to concentrate stays on one side as water is formed again on the other side, totally concentrating whatever it is we want to concentrate. It's an extraordinary technology that we're leading the way in right here. We work with one of the best in class manufacturing partnerships I think we could find uh, with Sumitomo. We're really excited about this partnership, particularly considering the global supply chain crunch that we're under right now. Uh, so we're very excited about that. So here's a little bit of a snapshot of our technology. Uh, it's on the, our website as well, if anyone would like to um, uh, learn more about it. This is a, a, a high level uh, snapshot kind of of our lithium solution that we do. Right now, the current approach to lithium is um, uh, lithium is pulled out of a, of, a, um, uh, of, a, of a source, whether it's an underground brine resource in let's say Arkansas or California or all over Canada and increase in Europe and, uh, and, and, and increase, what they really do is put it in these large evaporative ponds. And through that process for a couple of years, the water is evaporated and then lithium, uh, the lithium can be converted at that point from its natural state, lithium chloride, to the battery grade state, uh, lithium hydroxide. Our solution is on the bottom here. And you've probably heard, some of the audience here might have heard, might have heard of some of the leading uh, lithium technology companies that are out there, and what's known as direct lithium extraction, which is a really exciting technology that we love the proliferation of it because we're a complementary technology to direct lithium extraction. And here's how. Brine is, uh, lithium is pulled out of a brine, as you see in this um, uh, first step here. And then it undergoes this direct lithium extraction process. And it comes out of the brine in a pretty, the lithium is found in a pretty low concentration. And in the brine source, it's somewhere below, call it 1500 parts per million uh, TDS, total dissolved solids there. Um, that's relative to seawater, which is like 35,000 uh, parts per million. The direct lithium extraction process, uh, some of the companies that are out there are um, uh, Lilac, which is backed by Breakthrough Energy, which is the, uh, the Bill Gates um, environmental uh, venture focused fund. Um, what they do and what others like them do is they pull it out of the brine source and they're concentrating it up to about during um, uh, about, about 1500 or so PPM. I'm not speaking for Lilac. I don't exactly know their process or what it is they do um, in regards to how they differentiate from their technologies, but broadly speaking here. Um, there's about a dozen or so leading direct lithium extraction technologies that are out there and about 50 or so burgeoning ones, uh, we believe. So at that point, you have lithium at about a 1500% parts per million. Uh, that needs to get brought, that, that is brought up to about 60,000 parts per million through a reverse osmosis process. And at that point, we take it up all the way to about 300, 250 to 300,000 at a place that is optimal to convert it from, from lithium chloride to lithium hydroxide and creating distilled water in the process. Completely complementary technology. We enhance the production uh, for the resource on, uh, owner and uh, we're getting a lot of traction with, with, with this right now. And obviously is the big focus uh, for us, for our IP portfolio and for our commercial efforts. Here's a couple of the members of the team, uh, Dr. Hubert Fleming, uh, our head of strategy, Dr. Sean Ghiani, our head of technology, Dr. Matt Narrell, who I mentioned earlier, who's our senior engineer and oversees the uh, Toronto lab. Uh, please take a look at our website. You have the rest of the team there. And um, it's an extraordinary team. Um, I'm, and uh, that's it. Um, risking in, investing in early stage startups is, is, is risky. Please read the disclosures and go to our website and uh, or or the offering page as well and take a look at this this in detail. So Eric, that's um that's it for me. Perfect. And I just reclaimed control of the screen, so you are no longer sharing. I do love uh, an opportunity to remind folks that while we are in the business of helping investors invest in early stage companies, those investments are risky. So I I do love somebody taking that burden. Um, and sharing that. But 
Um, let's dig a little deeper. So you, you were wrapping up on team, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to share any more details that you uh, that you'd like to around uh, any advisory support or investment support or other players that you think help guide your vision um, that help get to the next level. I mean, you know, we we, we have an extraordinary team. Um, uh, the, the the board that's in place between Cynthia Archer, Bruce Lev, uh, Ted Cleary. Um, uh, these are these are all people who who are 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 you know incredibly strategic, important sounding boards for me, and are keeping us um, uh, moving forward from a commercial standpoint. Our advisory board, you know, is really some of the I I, I can't imagine putting a better one together. Uh, it's um, um, uh, there's um, um, uh, former Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, Sharon Burke. Um, Alex Murr, who's a who's a very um, uh, thoughtful private markets investor and the CEO of a um, uh, of a really interesting um, uh, uh, water company, and uh, and then of course Dr. Amanu Lal, who's you know arguably the leading hydrologist in the world. So um, you know we've got we've got a great team in place, and then then you know our 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 engineering team, who I uh, left out, you know. Mustafa Ghani, my, my my partners Chris uh, Kelly, Al, Alex Vogel. Uh, we've got an extraordinary team. So, you know, um, I don't know. You know I, that's, that, that's perfect. Yeah, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to share more about the advisors and board members. I know there's a there's a there's a star-studded cast over there. So, um, thank you so much for that. Um, somebody said looks very interesting. That was somebody who asked a question earlier. So, love that they're still engaged. I'm going to go ahead and use this opportunity to share one more time uh, the link to KMX Technologies. Uh, that's the link right there. And thank you so much, Zach, uh, Zachary, for coming on and sharing what you're building here. Yeah, yeah let me, uh, one, yeah. one second here. Let me, let me highlight okay. a couple of the commercial things because I would have thought there would have been some question around that, but you know, I will highlight it. You know, we, we announced an LOI last week with a UK-based uh, lithium company with projects in Chile. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've recently... Uh, conducted a uh, paid paid lab test uh, with a separate lithium company, um, and you know we 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 believe we're closing in on some pretty important transformational projects uh, with some with some pretty large uh, players in the space as well, and then of course looking at some very exciting industrial water treatment process uh, opportunities as well. So um, you know. Thanks, Eric. Really appreciate the chance to kind of highlight the, 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 the growing commercial portfolio too. And, you know, this is great. Love that, Zachary. Thanks for, for bringing us over to that. Those are some really exciting accomplishments. I think there's much more excitement uh, to come in the future as well. Thank you for that. Thanks a lot. Um, Okie dokie. So I added a link to that again. Um, that's KMX Technologies. Thank you so much, Zachary. Uh, last but certainly not least, let's bring us home with Proctor360. We have two, two team members on the line from that. Um, looks like Ganga, you are off mute. You want to start us off and then you can hand it over to Scott. Absolutely. Thanks, Eric. I really appreciate for this opportunity. We have a small video uh, which is going to be shared by Scott and then followed by that, we take Q&A and then we continue. Perfect. I just uh, granted access again. So go ahead, Scott. All right. Thanks for that introduction, Eric. Give me one second here and we'll queue this up. Great, we see it. Proctor360 is an emerging ed tech company that has developed a patent pending solution for securely monitoring online exam sessions. Our exclusive 360 Total View remote proctoring service and our cloud based SaaS product have enabled us to acquire customers across higher education, professional certification, commercial, and government sectors. With the global e-learning market projected to reach $1 trillion in value by 2027, secure online testing is crucial to supporting that growth. Apart from the COVID-19 pandemic, which certainly accelerated the trend in higher education toward remote learning models, e-learning growth is having a profound impact on social equality. Gone are the days when getting a college education or training for professional advancement meant that you absolutely must attend classes in person at a brick and mortar campus. But while technology has made education and training more accessible, 
the critical exams a student has to take to pass courses and especially in order to earn professional credentials still pose significant challenges. In order for remote learning to be seen as credible, the exams have to be just as secure as if they were taken in person, in a classroom, or in a test center environment. For the past 15 years, remote proctoring vendors have provided schools with technology that allows them to monitor students remotely while taking tests to prevent cheating. But the technology hasn't changed much in all that time. Whether they use AI or a human proctor, virtually all remote proctoring companies use the test taker's standard webcam to watch them during the exam session. And this technology simply isn't secure enough for high stakes exams. The camera doesn't see what else is happening in the room outside its narrow field of view, or even any notes that might be attached to the screen next to the camera lens. It's simply too easy to cheat these systems. This is why the most crucial exams for academic progress and professional advancement are still taken in person at a testing center or in a classroom. For e-learning to grow and benefit as many people as possible, remote proctoring technology has to improve. Proctor360 has solved this problem by developing a patent-pending remote testing headset and its 360 Total View remote proctoring service. The headset is a proprietary design that incorporates a 360-degree webcam, which provides our proctors with a complete view of the test taker's environment during their exam session, just as if they were taking the exam in a testing center or a classroom. Our cloud-based software platform captures the 360-degree video from the room, the video feed from the test taker's front-facing webcam, the test taker's screen activity, and the audio in the room through the microphone incorporated into the headset. This solution eliminates virtually all opportunities for the test taker to cheat and ensures that even high-stakes exams can be taken remotely with confidence. Following an initial seed funding round on Start Engine, we successfully produced a small manufacturing run of these headsets and they're currently in use by multiple customers. Institutional customers can lease or purchase an inventory of headsets for their students' use throughout the semester. And candidates for professional certification exams can simply register for an exam online, get the headset shipped to them, use it to take the exam, and then return it with the included shipping label when they're done. Our future plans also include distributing these headsets to local libraries nationwide. That would make it possible for virtually anyone to take a 360 Total View proctored exam, no matter where they're located. In addition to 360 Total View, Proctor360 has expanded its services to include all major forms of remote proctoring, including fully automated AI for lower stakes exam. And at the beginning of the pandemic, when college testing centers were forced to close their doors or significantly limit capacities, Proctor360 launched a software as a service remote proctoring solution that allows colleges and universities to use their existing staff with our platform to proctor their own students' exams. This cloud-based software platform is built on Amazon's AWS infrastructure and can scale infinitely to accommodate more and more customers without significantly adding to Proctor360's overhead costs. More than $500 million will be spent on remote proctoring in 2021, and analysts are expecting that value to double over the next five years. Companies like Proctor360 who are bringing new solutions to the remote proctoring market are in an excellent position to achieve substantial growth. The competitive landscape is fragmented with no major players currently dominating, making it easier for new companies like Proctor360 to gain market share through innovation. For Proctor360, this round of funding is all about fueling growth. We need to initiate a much larger manufacturing order for the 360 Total View headsets just to meet the demand from interested customers that we simply can't accommodate with our existing inventory. We also plan to expand our marketing and sales operations so that we have the manpower and resources to seize all available opportunities in the marketplace. Now, with the small, dedicated team, Proctor360 has accomplished a lot and we've achieved significant milestones. We're actively generating revenue and just since the beginning of this offering on Net Capital, we've announced two new customer acquisitions. One, an international partnership for proctoring finance professional certification exams across Brazil and the other, a five-year contract with the U.S. Department of State. Our next steps are all about scaling up and gaining market share. And with your investments, we look forward to sharing in our future success.
Thank you for that. Um, Scott, would you like to take it from here? I know you might have a physical device with you. I know we did last time. I'm not sure if you still do, but I, I think it's just so handy to see in real time. If you sure, could. sure, sure. I have it a little bit closer this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be used actually with the uh, with the microphone located on the uh, the right or left. You can see that it's fairly streamlined, fairly comfortable. It looks like an ordinary pair of you know Beats headphones. It's very lightweight. The uh, uh, ear the earpieces allow you to actually listen to audio that might be included with uh, a computer based exam, and also to c communicate with the remote proctor if you had any questions about your exam. The microphone, of course, would allow you to communicate with them as well, but it also gives the remote proctor the ability to monitor the audio in the room, because one of the areas that uh, almost any remote proctoring service can't really tell is if somebody is standing outside the uh, room just feeding you answers, right? Even if you can see the, the see around the entire room, that would be one area that you would want to be able to capture. And then, of course, the 360-degree webcam that's mounted in the top here, and it's actually composed with of 280 degree uh, lenses that face forward and backwards. And that accounts for the spherical images you saw in our uh, pitch video there. Everything connects easily through one standard USB 2.0 uh, plug. So you don't need a particularly high powered or modern computer in order to use it. And as long as you have a you know, relatively uh, decent internet connection, you're able to use our platform. So, I, so this is really interesting, and somebody's already saying this would be great for online business classes as well, and I, and I do agree with that sentiment. Um, there were also a couple other use cases that came up in your uh, in your individual webinar that I thought were really interesting. Um, outside of proctoring exams, and there's critical need for that for us to get to the point where e-learning really is ubiquitous. But but suspending that for a moment, can we talk about um, how the the recordings are saved to the cloud? It allows you to have this kind of circle back feedback loop where you can determine if there was cheating um, and so that you don't, you know, unnecessarily, in, you know, uh, get in the way of somebody's testing. Um, and then can you also talk about other corporate applications if you're good? Sure, absolutely. So uh, well, one of the most important things uh, uh, with remote proctoring is that you have the ability to go back and audit or review an individual student's exam session. One of the things that uh, came up for a lot of college students uh, throughout the pandemic when they were, uh, when colleges were just having to sort of come up with home build solutions where instructors and professors were just using Zoom rooms with lots of little thumbnails like you see currently on this, on this meeting. Uh, there's no way to go back and look at an individual uh, exam session for an individual student uh, in a setup like this. But with our platform, each individual student's exam session receives all of those data feeds that I just mentioned as one per, for each individual student. Uh, so that if there's ever a question for months down the line, because it's a cloud-based software platform, uh, we can archive those exam sessions for as long as the customer requires. And if there's ever a question about whether or not uh, they really earned their exam uh, results, then that can go back, you can go back and audit those results. Um, but it goes beyond uh, that application just for uh, higher education. Um, Really, there are all kinds of corporate applications that require proctoring. Uh, one example is a company that reached out to us that's a BPO. It's outsourced uh, sort of phone representatives and things like that. Uh, if you can imagine, uh, call centers don't really exist the way they used to anymore. There aren't people when you get when you get a customer service person on a phone, they're often not just sitting in a cubicle in a giant call center anymore. They're doing those things from their laptop at home. Uh, and they, you know, they work part time doing that. And if they're taking sensitive customer information, uh, you know, over their over those calls, you have to wonder how can you how can you make sure that those uh, those customer representatives aren't writing down credit card information or or social security numbers or bank account numbers and things like that. And for BPOs, that's a big liability issue. So we've actually had interest from companies like that that have individual uh, clients of their own. That they may be that they may be wanting to contract them to use their representatives, but they have to be able to ensure that there's no kind of fraud that can take place. So the the 360 Total View headset, instead of in that application, instead of proctoring an exam, would be proctoring a remote worker shift at their computer. It'd be able to see whether or not when they were taking a call from a customer, if they were writing down that credit card information instead of putting it into the computer. 
And of course, you can catch, catch people trying to commit fraud, but from a liability standpoint, it's really about being able to prove that if there was a fraud event with one of your customers' uh, companies, then you could always go back months back and say, okay, who did they communicate with uh, you know, at, at my company? Let's go back. What date did they, what did the fraud event happen? Let's go back and look and see if, you know, our agents actually had any part in that. Did they write anything down? Did they record anything? Were they talking to someone else in the room saying the numbers out loud and they were writing them down? So there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting applications. And, then, and really even for um, uh, assessment exams, when you're applying for a job, there's a lot of times when you have to take skills assessments. Uh, and if you're applying online and nowadays even having job interviews online, uh, you have to know whether or not the person applying for the job is the one that actually has the skills, is the one that actually uh, participated in the interview uh, once you hired them. So uh, we've also seen some interest from uh, HR departments in large staffing firms and corporations uh, because a lot of that recruitment process is now happening online also. Those applications, I think, are very interesting. And I think what's special, too, is that it's not just catching the, the people, that, the nefarious actors, the bad actors, but it's right. also not accidentally bundling in average people doing normal things that just might feel off. Can we talk a little bit about the kind of the false positives for cheating that have occurred, um, especially in like uh, bar exams, for example? I know you guys are working with a provider in that space. Yeah, we've seen, uh, and we can't, I think we should probably not say which uh, states we've had uh, conversations with, but uh, um, one of the issues with the, with the, uh, a very large state is, uh, uh, is that their Supreme Court ordered them to start delivering the bar exam during the pandemic remotely and finding a remote proctoring solution so that people didn't have to go and have these mass sessions where, you know, a thousand uh, lawyer candidates were all taking the exams together in one giant room. Um, and it became a problem. Uh, the, the AI uh, caught a lot of uh, incidents that were not necessarily cheating incidents, um, but because there was no human proctor and because there wasn't uh, uh, you know, enough data to actually verify what that can test candidate was doing, it caused a lot of issues. So the more data input that you can have when you're recording those exam sessions, the more likely you are, a bit, you are going to be able to defend yourself against any accusation that you might have cheated. Do you see that's a, a pretty fair explanation, Ganga? Absolutely, that's that's what it is, and there are a lot of use cases, you know, coming up day in and day out. And uh, we wanted to make sure that this technology used anywhere, uh, you know, possible. Because one problem we wanted to solve is. Is there a way your home or <clears throat> your home or office can be converted into a test center or the monitoring area? I know the privacy was a big concern, but we're trying to solve that problem also by providing libraries as an avenue for somebody to take the exam. So we are, we are looking into all possible avenues and uh, we are working most of the verticals. And uh, as Scott said, hiring is one of those things you know people wanted because there are a lot of scenarios now people are working from home, the interviews and everything are being conducted from home. You never know what they are doing, whether they are really working or they are the real people, you know, those kind of things. Because now the technology is enabling, but enabling only to the level of webcam. We wanted to make sure that just to protect, as you said, Eric, it is not only just monitoring the individuals, but also giving the assurance to other people who are taking the exam or the interview that was there was a fair and there was an integrity in the process as a whole. Yeah, you know, that's a fantastic point, Ganga. And the idea that those who are doing the right thing would be adversely affect, affected by those who are not doing the right thing. You know, these are largely scaled exams. These are high impact exams. These can be life defining uh, career opportunities or exams. And so there's really a lot at stake here. So I think it's really important. Um, and you, you know, with these last couple of minutes, your background is in proctoring. Uh, you, you, you are familiar with the, the original version. Can you share a little bit about your background there and, and only a, a, sure, a moment? Sure, about. sure. Uh, I own and operate multiple testing centers, physical brick and mortar testing centers uh, for the last 10 years. And I was always looking for a solution that is there a way we can deliver this exam securely from home. Now, when you walk into a testing center, what happens? You verify, somebody verifies your ID, somebody matches your name, with the you know name which is there on the you know the roster 
and then they will let you into the test room. Then once you are on the in the test room, there is a camera on your head, which is going to record everything. And if somebody has to audit that Eric is the person who has taken the exam, then there is a record. That's it. So same thing we are doing, replicating in a more convenient and easy way so that number one, it's cost effective. Number two, as Scott said, it is democratizing whole higher education system and also people working from home. Then we are liberating everything. As the internet is growing, obviously we need these kind of tools and technologies which empowers the human education and also people can work from anywhere you know with some kind of authenticity in place that's that's what we're trying to bring onto the table and it is going to revolutionize the world because we are the only one right now in the industry to make this happen and our customers are happy and and i'd like to point out for those who aren't familiar this works for uh handwritten exams as well in terms of a stand um and the the video can capture and the microphone would still capture as well so it doesn't have to just be uh computer-based exams but also uh, physical examinations. Um, with that being said, I know we have one minute left. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining, but I want to make sure that we didn't have any last questions sneaking through, and I think we're okay. So what I'd like to do is thank everybody for coming in. Thank you for the attendees. Thank you for your questions and your engagement in the chat. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and re-add the links to each of these companies directly into the chat one more time. As always, these companies are actively raising capital on the net capital platform, coming with that 5 p.m. energy from the West Coast here. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists for coming in and sharing about the good, uh, the opportunities that they're providing for folks. Please do click those links. Go ahead and revive those, review those offering statements. Always determine if you can invest or not based off of your risk tolerance. And then if you are so inclined, go ahead and hit that invest button. Um, one more point, this has been recorded as always. And so this will be uploaded to the Net Capital YouTube account. I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste that over really quickly. And boom, it's off. You can go one other thing there, uh, yeah. Eric, I'm sorry. Yeah. One other thing, if I can just throw that in there for all, all three of us, that uh, uh, companies that participated, which, by the way, it's great to be included with a couple of really cool other concepts as well. Um, don't forget, if you're thinking about these offerings later on uh, and you suddenly have questions, especially if you start looking at the offering materials in more detail, you can always post questions right on the offering page. Uh, and then that way, the answers that we provide uh, as, as founders are public and there for other potential investors to see as well. So I appreciate that. That's a really good point. Do, feel free to engage with the Q&A section built into every offering page. Um, these folks are, 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 are kind of ready and willing to answer your questions. If you didn't think about them here, I know my best questions come up after I get off the line also. So if that happens to you, feel free to engage with the offering page. Um, and I did add that link to the YouTube account. Feel free to review anything you might have missed. Also, feel free to share that with someone that you might think be interested. If you're not necessarily a wine connoisseur or if you're not super uh, sure about the future of electric cars or energy, if you're not understanding the advanced, uh, the importance of advanced placement exams, but you think someone else is, please do share that with them um, and get that support out there as well. We're just in the business of trying to help really good ideas uh, get funded by really cool and kind of democratize the access to capital here. So um, please engage with the Net Capital platform. All those links are there. The YouTube uh, link is there as well. And you can go ahead and click that link and, and review or learn more or share. Um, but last little piece here, I want to thank everybody here, especially our panelists. I think what you're doing is really exciting. Each of you, please continue to keep up the good work. And um, I'll see you on the next one. Thanks, Thanks a bunch. Thank you.